no, no. No trip starts like that. They start with pain and suffering of airports and flying. But far be it for Barb and I to complain. Our good friend Eric Ludwig had invited us on to an essentially free Caribbean cruise. Original Panama City. See that ruin sticking out? And then, uh, then they moved it from there to Casca Viejo, which is over, I guess, you know, beyond those buildings you can't see out on the point. We had flown in to Panama City, which is on the Pacific coast, and that very next morning we took a charter flight to meet his boat, which was on the Caribbean side. Panama is experiencing an economic boom right now as it has become the banking center for Latin America, and the city was dotted with brand new high-rises. When we got to Corazón de Jesús, we found it was just a small airstrip next to the beach. The terminal itself was bombed out and abandoned. Despite brief moments of worry as we waited, Peter, Eric's partner slash captain, soon showed up in the skiff aye, aye, and we made our way across the bay and before we knew it, the sails were hoisted and we were on our way. But I'm remiss. Before I go any further, let me introduce the participants in our fine adventure. There was, of course, Eric, our gracious host and longtime friend. The captain, Peter, is a Canadian who splits the year between being a contractor in British Columbia and running charters on Eric's boat. The first mate, Yolanda, was new to the boat, up from Australia via Humboldt County. George and Carrie were friends from Bishop. I knew George, a retired county superintendent, from many ski trips over the years. This was the first time I had met his wife Carrie, a school teacher, and needless to say, she quickly charmed us. There was our old friend Neil, also a newly minted retiree from the emergency physician world. Obviously my darling wife Barb, supposedly retired herself, but actually a full-time prison social worker. And finally, there were Ron and Saroj, neighbors of Eric's in Cabo Pulmo, Mexico. They both are retired professors of biology, and at 87 and 85, they were as young in spirit as anyone on the boat. Oh yeah, and then there was that guy Bill. The San Blas Islands hug the coast of the Isthmus of Panama in an archipelago of some 365 tiny islands. The local Kuna Indians joke that they have one for every day of the year. Our cruise was short, a night in Cayo Limon, another at Coco Banderas, and then four spread between two anchorages on Cayo Holandes. At the end, a water taxi took us back to the mainland and we drove back to Panama City. Once underway, the days quickly took on a most definite, relaxed rhythm. In the cool of the morning, we would normally go ashore onto one of the uninhabited islands. They were each so small, we would normally walk all the way around enjoying what there was to see. Even though the Kuna Indians communally own all of the islands and a 20-mile wide strip of land along the mainland, a different family owns the coconut trees on each island and coconuts used to pass for currency among them. All in all, the Kunas have proven to be excellent stewards for the island. Because of their rules prohibiting investment from and intermarriage with outsiders, the islands continue to be idyllic and the coral reefs remain in excellent shape. Oh my god, look at them! Woo! Stinger, is it hidden? The one I saw didn't look like that. The one I saw looked like, uh, you know, pointy wings. Oh, look what? at him. Yeah. It. it doesn't seem to care. And it just left. Then it was back to the boat, 
a little water sports, paddle boarding, kayaking, and most often wonderful snorkeling, for which I apologize, I have no underwater shots. Maybe a little spying on the neighbors from time to time? What do you say, Neil? These neighbors were interesting. They're backpackers making the trip up from Colombia. Fairly regularly, the Kuna would come by selling fish, lobster, squid, and whatever else they had the good fortune to catch that day. Eric had certainly done his best to lower expectations for the boat, but the truth is, it was really quite a nice yacht. I put zero effort into tidying it up for the photos, but nonetheless, you see that the communal space was quite generous, including an enormous split-level kitchen. Peter, it turns out, was a fantastic cook, and he ended up cooking a majority of the meals, despite all of us having signed up for one dinner. The four bedrooms, like on most yachts, were a weak point, but all things considered, not bad. Although I suspect more air would have been welcome in the back cabin. We did most of our sailing in the afternoons, and of course it always began with the elaborate ritual of hoisting the anchor, and ended by the equally elaborate and undoubtedly more important ritual of dropping the anchor correctly upon our arrival. Once under canvas with the engines turned off, sailing in the San Blas is pure pleasure. A huge barrier reef protects all of the islands, so even though the wind blew freely, there was no swell or rough water to worry about. Absolutely perfect for the land lovers among us. And of course, each day ended enjoying sundowners from the deck. On most days, the Kuna would also visit to see if we were interested in buying molas. These beautiful pieces of art made with several layers of different colored cotton cloth are designed to be the front chest and back panels of the women's traditional blouses. Mono con bananas. Oh, those are monos, okay. Monkeys. Monkeys. On the tiny island of Coco Banderas, there were a few small families living. When we went to visit, we were immediately accosted to pay the normal $2 per person fee. But after buying several coconuts, which they opened for us, and buying several more molas, as well as a few beers, they relented on the need to charge us for simply having visited their island. Their dugouts are called Cayucos, and they love George jumping in to help them get free from the beach. Then it was back to the boat where we had left Peter struggling over a starter which had burned itself out. It still just sits on top of this little pin. Does this one do it? Their efforts proved successful, and soon enough we were on our way once again. This would be our last day of sailing, and tomorrow a water taxi would pick us up and we would start their journey back to the 21st century. For now though, still time for a little fishing, and once again a magnificent evening sunset. That next morning, as we waited for the water taxi, there was time for a few group photos. And then we were off. On our way back to the mainland, we passed a group of densely populated islands called Karti. Being a water-based culture, as many as 50,000 kunas live on the various islands, with an additional 250,000 living along the coast of the mainland. Known for being one of the largest indigenous tribes still maintaining their traditional culture, their number is still tragically less than 10% of the number prior to the arrival of the Spanish. The 4x4s Eric had rented 
to pick us up soon arrived and we were off. Only six or eight years ago, the road was the craziest of trips imaginable, as the 4x4s crossed streams and slid down the steep, muddy slopes. But things have changed, and we enjoyed a much less wild drive on a beautifully paved highway. Back for a night in Panama City, Eric had chosen a small hotel for us in the old colonial part of town called Casco Viejo. We enjoyed one of the best meals at lunch at a small taqueria. Take my word for it, the photo gives no clue as to how good they tasted. Then that night, we went out on the town for our farewell dinner while welcoming a new crew of old friends arriving to sail with Eric south from Panama to Cartagena, Colombia. As Eric always says, good friends are great, but it's good friends that do adventures with you that are truly special.